All right, here we go. So episode 25, we're now another week closer to being pain-free at 100. And if we're at episode 25, we're now a quarter of the way to having 100 episodes. So we've still got some work to do, but uh, goddamn, 25. How about that? Pretty good. This is this is the the, the post United States uh, election special. We're just going to talk all about the politics and and the implications of uh, the, the 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 global relations as a consequence of the United States election. So stay tuned, sit back, relax, and we're going to tell you why we're right and you're wrong. Yeah, we're we're clearly political experts, so <laughs> we we got a lot to talk about today. I'm a pundit. <laughs> what do we have to talk about today? Well, I'm glad you asked. The last two weeks we've been talking about back pain. Um, so we talked about my injury and how that kind of progressed. And then the last week we talked about some of the things that needed to happen earlier to kind of put the brakes on that. Um, and so we talk in and around that about, about the idea or the concept of fibrous adhesion and that being something that is very common, but uncommonly treated and plays a big factor in back pain. And, and specifically that was a big factor in my back pain um, that we needed to get to earlier. So we keep talking about this thing called adhesion. We keep bringing it up. And so I think for the, for the benefit of our audience, we need to explain that a little bit because this is a big part of what we do. Um, unfortunately, it's something that is, is not addressed commonly. It, it's almost not even um, acknowledged commonly. And so we need to explain what it is. We need to explain why it's a problem. We need to explain how it becomes a problem and, and what can be done about it because it, we need to get it out of there, right? It's, it's not just something that might affect a couple of people here and there. It's something that affects a lot of people. And so if you're someone that has had an issue, you've had a, a complaint of some type, some sort of musculoskeletal pain, you've tried adjustments maybe you need to get adjusted every week or every two weeks because this problem keeps happening maybe you've tried to get lots of massages and and that problem feels a little bit better but then it just keeps coming back or maybe you've gone down the you know physiotherapy physical therapy exercise route and you've tried having exercises and the problem just kind of gets a little bit better but doesn't really go away if you fit into any of those camps then listen up because there's a pretty good chance that a component of your problem is fibrous tissue and it needs a, a very specific treatment. So Dr. Mike, let's get into some fibrous adhesion 101. Yeah, I mean, very basically, I think the, the best way to explain it to a lay person is, you know, your muscles are a stake. Right. They're, they're the equivalent of the steak and, and depending on the quality of that steak, right, kind of dictates how tough it is, um, kind of dictates how much you want to eat it, how easy it is to eat it, how you need to cook it. So you can literally think of your steak, you know, when you're born, it's like a beautiful filet mignon. It's, a, it's, it's an expensive cut. Everything is pr perfectly aligned. The fibers are beautiful. And then as you age and as you overuse those tissues, they kind of become like stew meat, you know, very, very tough, very rough. Um, you can't just put it on a, put it on the Barbie <laughs> and cook it. You know, you've got to throw it into a meat, in, in, into a stew or a soup so it can break down for a really long time. So, you know, you want your muscles to be a filet mignon. You don't want your muscles to be like cube steak where it's just really, really tough, tough piece of meat. Um, and that's the difference of what adhesion does. It, it turns your muscles from this kind of supple, flexible, strong, healthy tissue into something that's not as healthy. And you take a look at, okay, what really from, from I guess a microbiological standpoint or a histological standpoint, what's the difference between those two steaks? And the stew meat has a lot more connective tissue, right? That stew meat has a lot more 
fibrous spots. You bite into it and you're like, fuck, I could chew this forever and I feel like I'll never be able to swallow it. So really we want, again, our muscles to be as healthy as possible and, and be as close to the filet mignon side of the steak spectrum as possible by keeping that connective tissue, that tough, fibrous, chewy, disgusting um, type of tissue out of that meat. So that's what I try to get my patients to understand the difference. You could think of it like it's super glue, right? If you were to cut into a steak and it had super glue in it and you'd be chewing it forever, um, you know, it wouldn't be as flexible, you know, it wouldn't be as strong. So on kind of the macro level, that's what fibrous adhesion is from like a biological standpoint it's the best way that i can explain it yeah we were actually eating steaks off the barbecue the other night and um we had these porterhouse steaks and it was pretty much like that there was those you know there was a, a quite a, a a thick kind of strip of uh of fatty tissue like connective tissue fatty tissue on the outside of it and um and just biting into this steak it was it was pretty rough it was pretty chewy and, um, and Vera made the comment to me and she said, you know, I'm not enjoying this steak. I wish we had the nice eye fillet that we usually get. That's really nice and soft. And that's kind of the difference, right? That's, that's sort of what we're talking about. And I think, you know, most people are familiar with the idea of scar tissue as a, as a concept, right? Because, you, but it's kind of often thought about in the, in the sense of like a cut that's healed or some sort of an injury that that's healed and so you can physically see across the skin that there's some scar tissue there and and most people kind of accept that so that's kind of what we're talking about in the sense that there's those collagen fibers but it doesn't have to be a physical trauma that you can develop this problem so yes certainly when there's something that happens like that and there's a, a direct injury it's going to heal strong with some of those fibers but it's not the only way that that happens. And, and it's you know, going to be more common in people to still develop those, um, those fibers within the tissues um, and not necessarily just within muscles either. We get this within other connective tissues and we get this between other muscles and between other things that stick it together. So you know, using your idea of super glue. Um, so what are some of the other mechanisms, I guess, that we can develop this rather than just having a, a direct injury? Um, what are some of the other ways that, that this becomes a problem and it, it, what's probably more common? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you brought up the skin analogy because I can piggyback off that skin analogy to try and um, explain then what the more common development pattern of adhesion is. So, you know, you cut your arm, a keloid scar forms, that is scar tissue. Uh, another way that we can look at it from, in terms of a more common way is, is think of it like a callus. So you develop calluses because you overuse a certain portion of your skin, whether you're playing cricket, you know, you're going to develop calluses on your, I don't know, your batting hand, same with baseball, same with playing guitar, you develop calluses on your fingers, same with CrossFit, you develop calluses from a barbell. So we, we will, that is functionally an increase in tougher collagenous fibers um, at any point, right? You, you get a new pair of boat shoes. You need to develop that callus on the back of your, of, of, of your heel, right? We used to have, there's a fraternity. We used to have people wear our Sperry's for us until they were broken in. So we wouldn't callus ourselves, but that's really the more common mechanism. And you can look at it the same way in a muscle tissue. Yes, you can acutely injure a muscle tissue. You can tear your hamstring and there will be an increased deposit of, of that tough, super gluey cartilage, not cartilaginous, but collagenous tissue in there. But you can also overuse a particular part of your muscle enough to where it starts to really break down. And that mechanism is a little bit different. It's not, um, it's not boom, there's a cut or an overt disruption in tissue and, and scar tissue goes in to kind of bridge that gap in an effort to heal. But as we overuse a muscle tissue, you will actually decrease the oxygen flow to that muscle. And we're gonna get a little bit specific here, but as you decrease oxygen flow to a particular muscle, what you're going to do is basically upregulate the types of cells that produce the collagen 
versus the types of cells that produce the muscle fiber. So, you know, I, I guess that's like a hot socio-political term right now, but like a stem cell, right? A stem cell is something that is, is, is an evolutionary cell that can kind of split off into multiple different areas. And so you have this stem cell and in the presence of a ton of oxygen, what it's going to do is it's going to then split off into what they call a myocyte, which is just a fancy way to say a, 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 a cell that produces muscle fiber. In the absence of oxygen, what you're going to do is you're going to get that turned into a fibroblast, excuse me, a myoblast versus a fibroblast. And that's going to lay down that thick collagenous tissue. So on the really, really micro level, decrease oxygen going to cause increased fibroblast proliferation and production, which is going to cause more adhesion, um, which is the most common way that you can kind of develop those, those deposits of, uh, of collagen. Yeah. So this is just a very basic physiological process that exists in everyone. And when you talk about, you know, overuse of muscles and things like that, I think the first thing that kind of comes to mind is, you know, an activity like, CrossFit, for instance, that that's kind of what you think of. You're sort of thinking about like high repetitions, um, you know, like a real physical activity like that. But it kind of comes back to anything that's done repetitively, any sort of any sort of action, really. So that could be could be anyone that kind of anyone that sits at a desk that uses something very repetitively, or anyone you know in an occupational role that just does something over and over and over. It's the same thing. So this isn't a problem that's just reserved for like people that are very active and lifting weights over and over and over again. This is something that affects everyone. And the other, you know, the other deal with that is the, you mentioned the hypoxia, right? So we're talking about where there's a decreased blood flow to an area and the, the reaction that is caused by that. And that can just be anyone that's in a, in a really crappy posture for a long time. Um, and, and we see that a lot, you know, like people that do sit at a desk that shoulders hunch forward and, you know, that sort of thing that creates some level of hypoxia. And that's why these, you know, we, we see these adhesions get formed in these areas that are very typical areas and we see things getting stuck to each other. So, you know, it's, it's not a problem that's reserved for a certain group of people by any means. It's a problem that is in all of us. Yeah, it happens to everybody. And, and I would make the argument that a healthy dose of exercise will actually prevent adhesion from happening because you're getting then through the exercise bouts, um, you're, you're eliminating that hypoxic state. Um, so you have to kind of take that into consideration and, you know, exercise is all, is all dose dependent. Sitting down is all dose dependent. Everything is dose dependent because, you know, if you stand up too long, maybe your feet are the things that become hypoxic right? Maybe your quads are the things that come hypoxic. So it, it, it's all about finding that balance and understanding that any prolonged posture, or any repetitive motion is going to cause adhesion in the long run. And the best thing to do is to not be in those postures or not create such a competitive movement environment. But if you're somebody that you're a carpenter and you've you got a hammer and that's the way that you feed your family, then we've got to design a way for you know, us to get ahead of that adhesion a little bit and keep it off um, to, to, to enable you to continue to do what you want to do. Yeah. I think most folks that have had a, a scar form before, and you would have, you would have felt that, right. You would have sort of maybe taken a thumb and felt over it and you would, you would notice that it's just a bit thicker. It's a little bit harder. It, you can really feel that there. It just, it doesn't compress as nicely as what a normal piece of tissue would. You can really always feel that. And, you know, so it, that's the skill that we develop to be able to find that within the human body to be able to eliminate it. It's, and it's, but it's often not as pronounced as like a big, thick, juicy scar, you know, it's often much more subtle than that, but it, it's generally that sort of consistency. So um, I guess let's kind of segue into how we deal with this because, you know, you, we sort of started the episode by talking about chiropractic adjustments aren't going to fix this. 
getting compressive massages and sports massages and whatever other type of massages are not going to fix it. Lacrosse balls and, and stretches are not going to fix it. Dry needling and, you know, we can, the list kind of goes on. What do we need to do to this tissue to effectively get it out of the body? Yeah, we can, I mean, we can continue to use the, the callus or the, the keloid scar as a way to kind of guide things, right? So find, and if you're listening, find any scar on your body and try and just compress the hell out of it. And then after you do it for a minute, take your thumb off and see, oh, did that scar go down? No, probably not, right? You, you can't, you're not going to break down that adhesion with that level of compression. I mean, I think that what, what the study that everybody likes to reference is a thousand pounds of, of force is needed in order to break down collagenous tissue. You're not going to apply that thousand pound force. And if you do apply that thousand pound force, then, you know, good luck to your bones. Um, what you need to functionally do, and, and you can do this with a, with a keloid scar to varying degrees of success is you need to tension that scar tissue and through tensioning that scar tissue, you can actually get it to reduce. And so we can use the callus analogy as a way to guide kind of the mechanism for how we're going to treat scar tissue. If you have a callus on your hand, right? You go ahead and you press that callus, you compress it as much as you can and you take it off. You're not going to actually improve the state of that callus. You're not going to actually make it better. What you can do is you can apply some tension and in the, in the form of a callus, bear with me. It's a, oftentimes it's, you know, something like a pommel stone, right? You can apply a, a, a large volume of micro tensions to that surface and you can actually decrease that. You can kind of extrapolate that to our steak analogy. You can hit a steak as much times as you want with a hammer and you may actually tenderize the muscle tissues, but you're not going to actually break down that collagen or, or that tough connective tissue within the steak. You need to basically pin it down and stretch it off. You got to think of it like, you know, if you had a, a, a rubber band and that rubber band was, was stuck together to another rubber band with a piece of chewing gum, you could run over those two rubber bands and that piece of chewing gum with a semi truck with an 18 wheeler, right? And they're still going to be together. I mean, you you may accidentally break it just from the the friction of the surface or or the the tread of the tire. But what you the simplest way to do it is to just take one rubber band, pin down the piece of gum, and pull it right off, and you'd actually break through that scar tissue and that adhesion. So um, compression does not fix adhesion. Vibration does not fix adhesion. At least the, the vibration that you're getting from, you know, your standard, I don't know, your, your fucking, what do they call it? The, the G3 or something the like that. The Theragon. G the Theragon or whatever. I mean, the Theragon is basically a cyclical percussion instrument. It's not actually a vibration instrument. You could theoretically break down adhesion with enough vibration, but you'd you destroy your skin and your muscle tissue and everything else uh, uh, along with it. So tension is the name of the game and you can either acquire that tension um, through surface tension. So scraping, um, or you can acquire that tension through an actual, uh, I don't want to bastardize what we do, but a, a simple pin and stretch like you would do to that rubber band and, and um, that piece of gum. Yeah. I think I love the rubber band analogy, but I think the most, the most basic way to kind of explain it is if, uh, I mean, this is just what helped me kind of conceptualize it. But if you have a, a rubber band and you try to jump on it, you know, you try to hit it with a hammer, you try to compress it, like you could compress the shit out of that, but it's just, it's not going to change. You know, we, we know that that's a thing, but if you take that same rubber band and slowly start to pull it apart and just keep that tension going, it's got to hit a point where it snaps. It doesn't matter how much you compress it, but if you put that tension on that thing and pull it apart, at some point, it's going to have a, a point where it breaks, right? Uh, so that's what we get with these, with these collagen fibers in the body. Um, our job is to, firstly, we've got to find them. So that's our, that's our palpatory skill. Secondly, then, we've got to be able to work with the body to apply the right amount of pretension 
to actually get that tissue under enough tension so that as soon as we start to move, we're ready to rock and roll. And then, so there's a little bit of movement that's added on top of that. And we have to actually take it past that, that point where that rubber band snaps to actually make the change. Because if, you know, we know if we're using that rubber band analogy, if we don't take it past that point, then it's, it's going to stretch it and it might feel kind of okay for a little while, but if it hasn't actually gone past that breaking point, then that, you know, that, that lasting change hasn't occurred. So, so that's the skill. We've got to find it yeah. first and then we've got to actually apply it. And that, and that number is well researched. I think it's, you know, seven pounds of force or I don't know if, what do you got? Do you guys use the Imperial or the metric system down there? Yeah. Well, I think the way that I've read it, like, I think it's mostly in pounds because that's what the literature kind of talks about. Yeah. So it'd be like three point what two kilos of force yeah roughly something half yeah something like that so you know with that in mind it, it has to be skillful it has to be expert because 6.9 pounds isn't going to do it it's going to stretch it a lot but it's certainly not going to break it right 7.1 it's going to break it but we're also going to break some of the surrounding tissues and it's going to be more uncomfortable for the patient so what we're trying to do is deliver the maximum level of effect with as little discomfort to the patient as possible with as little collateral damage as possible. Um, because if you collaterally damage a lot of those tissues, you can actually propagate more, more scar tissue buildup. So it's very, very skillful. And, you know, the way our clinics are set up is a, is a specific way to everything revolves around that. Everything revolves around finding and removing that adhesion, right? We have, you know, at least I have a clinical assistant because I found that it allows me to apply that seven pounds of force in the exact vector that I want to in a comprehensive way, right? We take, we don't treat on the first visit because I've got to know exactly where that adhesion is. I got to know the direction is. I got to know the shape of it. Is it heart shaped? Is it club shaped? Is it diamond shaped? Does it look like a, you know, there's a banana shaped adhesion on somebody's back. I've got to know everything about that because that's, that's my job. And that's the way that, um, that's the level of precision and expertise that is needed to remove that adhesion. Yeah, let's use the example of treating the sciatic nerve at the hip because that's it's pretty common. So if someone comes in with a, a low back or tight hamstrings or whatever it is, this is something that, that happens pretty commonly in both of our offices. But people listening to this might might be aware of that. So, you know, that patient's lying on their side. We need to palpate around the hip area. And so we're actually feeling for you know, where there's a little bit of decreased space and we're actually, we're bowing the sciatic nerve. We're actually feeling for mobility there. And these changes are super subtle. It's just something that, that we've developed that skill over time by feeling hundreds of them basically. And so you start to get an idea for what feels normal and what feels a little bit abnormal. So we want to locate that spot, that very specific spot that is not moving as what we would call full. So if you've been a patient here at this point, you're going to actually feel us actually take a deeper contact on that area. So we're actually sinking in onto that. So that's where that adhesion tissue is. Then you're going to actually feel us take tension before anything else. So it actually tensions up in a way that's going proximal. So it's actually going up you know, further towards you, further up towards your body. So it, this is the pretension that we're talking about. We're actually setting that before anything else happens so that when the movement does happen and when we when we start to move the hip we're already at like peak tension we're ready to go so we've taken the slack out of the system so when that hip does start to move that rubber band is already at its capacity or as close to it as that we can get to so that we're getting the maximum amount of tension out of that movement so that's one example of how we do that at the hip, but you can, you know, you can take this into any of the other regions of the body or any of the other joints of the body that we apply this around. Um, it's, it, it, it's very specific. And, and Mike, you mentioned that, you know, the vectors and things like that, that come into play. And those are so subtle as well, right? Because if we, you know, using that example of the hip, 
it's a slow movement that you want to create because you want to feel what's happening underneath your hand and make those micro adjustments. And, you know, that might be as simple as just dropping the leg down towards the couch a little bit to increase that tension even further. So, you know, this is precision, right? Yeah. And, and everybody has, well, not everybody, but you know, you and I have a fantastic understanding of anatomy and where things should be and the direction that things should travel, but everybody is different you know, your hip structure can be different than my hip structure. And that's going to require, you know, instead of me being at a force vector of 45 degrees, maybe I've got to be 47 degrees. And so you're like two degrees, Mike, like what the hell are you talking about? But two degrees may be the difference between seeing you for eight visits and seeing you for 10 visits. And that's a big deal to the patient, right? That's, you know, in my case, you just saved $110, you know, you've saved two trips out to Whitestone where, you know, it's a pretty residential area. So maybe not a ton of people live there. You've, 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 you've been able to spend, you know, extra hours with your family, with your fiance, with your loved ones, with whomever. So that's a big deal to us. Um, and, and it's those little changes that really make a difference in a treatment plan, right? What direction are your hip capsule fibers actually oriented in? based on your pelvic structure, based on your, your, your femur structure, where's your greater trochanter? Is it different? Does your sciatic nerve sit closer to your trochanter than somebody else? All these things make a really, really big difference. You know, uh, just what's the size of your vastus medialis compared to your rectus femoris, right? Is it smaller? Is it bigger? Does that give me a little bit more real estate to work with? Does it give me less real estate to work with? So it's a ridiculously complicated thing. And that's why we do what we do because, you know, chronic muscle skeletal joint pain is, you know, we, we talk about a pandemic literally in terms of COVID-19, but from a figurative pandemic standpoint, the more people suffering from joint pain out there than, than anything else. And, you know, we owe it to our patients. We owe it to ourselves to be that good, to be the difference between a 98% proficiency and a 99% proficiency. It matters, matters to you. It matters to us. It matters to the state of the world. Yeah. I think if there's anything to take away from this episode, it's that treating soft tissue structures is a highly technical thing to do and it needs to be, but it, unfortunately it's often seen as something that's just very simple, very rudimentary. And, you know, maybe that's why some of those problems aren't getting better. But it, it, is very, it is very technical. It does need a high level of skill. That skill needs to be developed over time. Um, there's a lot of thought that goes into it, a lot of time, a lot of practice. If it was easy, nobody would have joint pain. How many chiropractors, physios, physical therapists, osteopaths do you know? There's one on every block, right? There's, there's plenty of healthcare practitioners practitioners out there that are licensed to be able to do this. So uh, there's not a, there's not a supply problem. There's not a demand problem. It's an execution problem. And we're looking to solve that execution problem. All right. Well, that sounds like a good way to wrap this episode up. Any final thoughts, Dr. Mike? I got them all out there. All right. Well, let's call it. Let's leave it there. So 25 episodes are down. We are one quarter of a way to, uh, to the hundred. And uh, that's what this podcast is all about, right? The magical hundred. Amen. All right, folks. We'll see you next week.